did we first meet? Because obviously myself and Sean met first, and then obviously met Paul later on. So we probably met first of all. It's, it's about eighty, about eighty-eight or something. Oh, Eight, maybe sooner. Yeah. Maybe yeah. So, uh, but, but we were because we're from kind of suburban Hertfordshire. So I was from a little village. We kind of almost like rival posses, if you can imagine that. Simon, you know, with his Def Jam jacket on and his uh, Def Jam belt or name belt or something. I think I had, yeah, and it was made down around here, down at Connors. Yeah, and I, I had my, I had my um, dungarees and my, my ponytail, and we, we were kind of. Someone out of boys <laughs> Yeah, just <laughs> like that, a bit suspicious of each other. Uh, uh, so you know, it's like oh, there's some hip hop kids. And uh, there's those kind of rave, rave kids. those rave kids, and, you know, used to kind of check each other out outside the wimpy and that kind of stuff. <laughs> but then we we got to we got to chat him, didn't we? Yeah. In a, in a uh, Hart, Hartford ran uh, is sort of linked to Paul as well. Uh, Hartford, Hartford had a club called Stags, and uh, Sean Sean was playing down there one night, and uh, I shot down there, and. It's not really the sort of music that I was into, being the sort of moody hip hop kid with his Def Jam top on and no belt and all that. But uh, Sean was playing down there, went down there, and uh, he played a, a track called Grand Piano. But it was Mixmaster, is it? Wasn't Something it? Yeah. like that, yeah. And, and I really, got, I really, really liked it. It was it reminded me of the Dynamix stuff, the Cold Cut stuff from sort of the, the hip hop days. We got chatting, and we sort of got chatting about music and. It sort of it grew. It grew from there, and it was. And then, and then you said to me at some point, you said, "There's a bloke who lives in my village, and he's got, a he's got, he, no, he's got a, he, or a studio, yes, a studio in his yeah. mum's in his bedroom at his mum's house." I was like, "What? A, man, a bloke's got a studio?" And it's like, Rob, "Yeah." That and that was Rob Playford. So, kind of, we 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 got involved with him. He, he'd already maybe put his first record out. And yeah, the, and we, this was out, TRP, he, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and TRP, we, and yeah, we, were, we were hassling him for white labels and got them, and then kind of relationship with him grew from there. And then it was maybe you were friends with his girlfriend, that was it, you knew his girlfriend. That's right, yeah. And, and uh, we, we, we sort of said, you know, any chance you can, can hassle him so we can get into the studio. Um, and he, he was like, he was quite no. <laughs> and she was like, oh, go on, they're, not, they're nice lads, let them in, they want to make a record. Um, and eventually kind of capitulated and in we went. And that's, that's where we made the first track, which was no respect, I think, wasn't it? That was the very first track. When we were sampling stuff, if, it was, if we were sampling something that was at 33, we'd have to put it on 45 plus 8 pitch so that it went quicker and would take up less memory in the sampler. Do you remember? And then we'd pitch it back down. It's a great memory, isn't it? It's just, this is just a blur to me. <laughs> yeah, Pirate Radio um, was the big influence. Back then it was Sunrise and Centre Force um, were the big London ones that we would listen to. In terms of going out, yeah, the local club, I think much like all the local clubs up and down the country at that time started to play a bit of house music or underground music you know as a kind of reaction to the warehouse parties and 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 raves that had started yeah, it wasn't you know where you went no 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 it's just i think the the whole reason getting back to this whole stags thing which then became zeros which is kind of where i sort of came into the equation in about 91 92 that was like the meeting point for everybody in Hartford and everybody would go there, but it wasn't full on kind of what you would call rave now because it was a middle of the town nightclub. Obviously I would, because I was resident there for 15 years, so ultimately. So I was playing like anything and everything. I would only drop in the odd kind of, like, I don't know, break for love kind of tune and that kind of thing in between other tunes that were around at the time, you know, just to try and play a bit of everything. So it wasn't a full on rave club as such, was it? But. No. It, I mean, the main place we would go to was Music Power, Music Power, down which was on Green, Green Lanes. Lanes. And uh, down into here, uh, I mean, you would be talking, obviously, Black Market, uh, uh, Hitman Records, remember Hitman that was up there, Red? Red Records, records which became there. Unity Records down on Beak Street. Yeah. Um, Grove. And then Boogie Times down in Romford, which is where the one that Suburban Bass was run out of. Um, and it, it was kind of maybe a... a year or so after that when um, a guy 
moved down to Hartford and opened a, a record shop in Hartford, right, um, next, door the right next door to the yeah. nightclub. So you, you know the scene's being set now. <laughs> yeah, which which this guy turned out to be the guy and ended up doing the Omni Trio stuff. But he was just he used to work at Virgin Megastore in London and <laughs> moved down to the suburbs to open a record shop just selling CDs as I it was back then. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, it and was we, free uh, coffee. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah free coffee with every CD and I yeah. used to go in there and say, what can you, you get can you get me some promos of these? And he'd say, I don't know. He'd go and anyway, he'd say the rep, well the rep from such and such a company was here last week, let's have a look. And he'd have a stack of promos under his thing and go, look. and I'd like say, like, I, I've been after these for mu for weeks, kind of thing. And he'd say, well you can take them. What else do you want? And then gradually, I think Rob was very quick to catch up. He was quick to realise yeah, that it was a the CDs and all that kind of rubbish. And then it became a real player in the kind of if you look on the back of any flyer from that day, you know you'd have had your boogie times and your black markets. And then Parliament was always there because it became like a key player for, not only for people getting their their white label stuff, but for tickets to events and all that kind of stuff as well. So it, you know, it was up there. And, and yeah, and it also brought you know. And it's own label. Yeah, exactly. We had our own label. We started, yeah, which we did in 1991, and you know, it was just developed from there. And then that's kind of how we all kind of got together. And it, you know, because it was it was where people came to buy all their tunes. Um, and then the rest is history, as far as Omnitrio was concerned. Because then Rob, like Rob and I, were doing stuff on on our own label. Then he Simon signed signed Rob to Moving Shadow. Um, and it kind of went from there, didn't it? Yeah, yeah well, yeah. I mean, us, we, we made the recommendation to Rob Playford about this guy who runs a record shop who's making some stuff. And Rob went down there and chatted to, to Rob Haig, Omni Trio, and then he ended up signing him and what the rest of history. <laughs> yeah. We got an option to re-release uh, Bombscare. Someone wanted to, mm. to re-release it on a, on a major label to see if they, you know, because it, 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 even by that, that point, it seemed to kind of have bit of longevity and someone thought oh we can make a hit out of it so we assigned it to uh, BMG but at the time they were like okay well you know but we want to really push this you know we're gonna need um, we're gonna need someone to be in the video to do the press shots for smash hits all of this kind of stuff now if you imagine this is in 95 I think it was or something like that we're far too cool for Hearing this smash hits, you know, the jungle kind of drum and bass things down. I've started doing my solo we're stuff. We're like, right, we need a you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who does anyone know someone who who, mad who, who fits the bill to front this for us? And, and, and it was like, Rosie put his hand he up, he put his hand up, yeah. jumped up and down, shouting, Me, me, me. <laughs> well, no, prior to that, hang on, because there's a backstory, because prior to that, we'd, we we. I, I, me and Omnitrio, Rob Omnitrio had said, why don't we remix Bomb Scare to Rob? Yeah, um, yeah, you've been doing your so, own stuff. Yeah. So we've been doing our own thing. So we did this remix of Bomb Scare, which, which we sold in as a fake import. Um, and it shifted thousands of units, yeah, didn't nice. it? It went yeah. mental. And that's how the, it sort of was picked up by the Arista thing and the BMG thing. Um, but yeah, just, I was, we were, because by this point I was working at Moving Shadow and I was, put, I was the one doing the mail out, putting the records in the, in the mailers and all that. And then one day we just had a meeting in the office said, and they got said, and yeah, of course, yeah, how would you like to do this? Now, of course, at the time I was a complete media whore anyway, because I was desperate to I mean, do anything. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, because I was, I just started working at Kiss on one of the early shows there at Kiss and that kind of thing. So I was just desperate to do anything in the media and do, you know, just, so they said, look, do you want to, do you want to front this campaign? And I was like, yeah, um, you know, why not? I've got to say, the picture of him looking awkward in smash hits is what is one of my all time I'll, I'll find a copy and uh and, and send it up to you because it's one of my all time favorites the, the thing was it, it had, when it had, had its original release it got to number 44 i think in the charts in, yeah, in yeah, the top, top 40 yeah, yeah, so. um so when um arista and bmg kind of got behind it and wanted to do the re-release and they get in you know various remixes done dj sneak and various Actually, people back then and um and they said okay we want to do a video and have a launch party and all press, this press so we did all of that i mean it, it, and the the guy who 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 had a and r'd it came down to the launch party that was at this club kind of down near us quite a big club 
and um, he, he come right. down to oversee. And I was shooting a bit of the video down there, and so, so he's come down. I didn't get let in. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. I didn't get lit because oh. I was white trainers. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> so, so we do this launch party and then all of a sudden there's this massive fight uh, erupts and it's just gone from a couple of people fighting to like a complete God, wild yeah. west yeah. He, he was DJing at the time. But also doubled as doorman for the club uh, and, as well. And he, he's, he's run out from, from the behind the decks, out the corridor, out the corridor, around the back, smashed a couple of people up and gone back in to, fin to mix the next record in, right? <laughs> by, this point, by, this, by this point, there's, there's like 10 people out of 1,500 left in this club, yeah. right? It's just been evacuated. And the A&R guy, Terry, yeah, was standing there like this. Had to, had to go back to, uh, to his board meeting at BMG on the Monday, and they said, so how would everything go on Friday? And he was like, yeah, yeah, it went really well. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was a bit mad. It was, but um, but yeah. So so then it was re-released. It was re-released and reached number forty-four again. Yeah, because uh, there was a, a renewed IRA bombing campaign or something. So no radio station would touch it because it was called Bomb Scare. Yeah. Nobody wanted to go anywhere near it.